Welcome to the August 2014 edition of Inside Rice University. Classes will start up later this month, but campus has been busy with activity all summer. The Rice campus has a new building, the Anderson Clark Center, a new art installation, and a new architecture project across the street at Herman Park. It was foresight and vision that led to the opening of these doors. The vision of Edgar O'Dell Lovett, Rice's first president, who recognized the value the Institute could be to Houston if it invited and welcomed its citizens to campus. The vision of the university, which is part of our city's prosperity and success. Supporting us in this high endeavor has put Rice in the forefront of continuing education nationally. And I know a lot of my colleagues around the country are a little bit envious about our new building. The vision of Susie and Mel Glasscock, whose support of continuing studies at Rice has ensured our future in the 21st century. We would not be gathered here today without you two. The vision of the Anderson and Clark families, who have served Rice so ably and loyally over the years. We are honored to have your names on our building. And if there's one point at which we know that William Marsh Rice's vision and Edgar O'Dell Lovett's vision intersected, it was around this idea that this institute, which became this university, would be something great for the city of Houston. So this is truly an extraordinary day for us. As a little over 100 years later, we put a permanent building on our campus dedicated to the School of Continuing Studies. This is a great day for Rice and for the Houston community more broadly. Um, this project is uh, the direct result of really several things. It's original vision of our founding president, Edgar O'Dell Lovett, that we be connected to the community. It's the commitment of Houstonians to be involved with Rice. It's the commitment of the Glasscox to help establish the, the School of Continuing Studies and then most recently, obviously, is the coming together of two great families, the, the Clarks and the Andersons, to, uh, to make this beautiful building possible. Good to see you. You know, I haven't cried all day, but I look at you with I saw. I want to thank Mary McIntyre for her leadership as Dean of the School of Continuing Studies. She's just been fabulous and fabulous to work with. Today is a fulfillment of her dream for a building for the school. The D. Kent and Linda C. Anderson and Robert L. and Jean T. Clark building is the completion of a circle that began over 50 years ago when Kent and Bob and I were undergraduates together at Rice. Mel, Linda, and Puddin joined the circle in the 60s. And our lives have intertwined in so many ways through the years that their generosity should become the naming decision for this building completes the circle and begins a new one. It's the Andersons and the Clarks who should be thanking Rice for all the things that have meant so much in the lives of our two families. Most importantly, it brought our two families together in the first place. If it hadn't been for Rice and Hanson College, uh, I would have never met Kent. And despite the fact that he poured water on me and, subject, and subjected me to all sorts of other indignities when he was a sophomore and I was only a freshman, it was the beginning of a lifelong uh, friendship and a business partnership that has continued today. As I was preparing these remarks, I was re reflecting on all of the key values that my parents worked tirelessly on instilling into my sisters and me such as the value of education and hard work and fellowship and philanthropy. And this is what made this building and this project so meaningful to the Anderson family. It's a gift of education and to lifelong education of that. Buildings are important, but what happens in buildings is more important. And I really think the legacy of this building will be all the people and the families and the generations that benefit from what happens here. Well, the Glasgow School, when I first came to it, must have been 
Oh, 36, 37 years ago. And it was, uh, you very much had to use your uh, imagination so that you could find good places to teach. It's been a dream in progress. That's what it really has been. And it took that initial dream and vision to make it grow to this stage. Some sculpture you see is an image and it really feels very architectural and strongly related to the building and you, you sort of, it's made to look at but not made to necessarily engage in a personal way. The piece is named In Play. I wanted you to feel like you could move up to them, you'd see one thing, you'd move away from them, see another, and that they potentially were always changing, that they were organic in some way rather than, although there's a geometry there, that they were organic. They're made out of bronze. A lot of the time I work with things that have um, a fabric nature to them, that catch a gesture, that feel as if that they're, they're active in some way. I also use fabric that's recognizable um, in some way that you, you can associate to, if they're, in this case, bed sheets or shirts or bits of lace, or so that you actually have this kind of relationship to them. I started with those and make the shapes in, in those saturated with wax and then they get translated through a very long process. They took about a year and a half to make. Um, to, they get translated by being cut up and burned away in, in, in molds, which we refer to as investments. Um, and then um, those spaces that are left when they're burned away get filled with bronze and um, then they get, all the parts get welded back together. I mean, the, the common misnomer is that I simply take fabric things and dip them in bronze. Rice has a long, important history in the arts, and I'm just thrilled to be part of it, I mean, frankly. Um, it's, I'm thrilled. Uh, I couldn't ask for a better sight. The general idea here was in this long expanse of undifferentiated space, it's kind of a series of parallel spaces, was to make a place. This is a place where there was no place before. As part of Herman's Park Centennial, we did an Art in the Park program where we have wonderful art installations and we wanted to have our partners across the street, Rice University, do a project. Jay Baker, who is a Rice graduate and is on the park board and also a big supporter of the Rice Building Workshop, thought it would be a great opportunity for us to do uh, something here in the park in relationship to uh, Rice. 101 years for Rice, 100 years for Herman Park. The centennial came about and Phoebe Tudor, whose husband is on the, the trustees board at Rice, we should do something. So I asked the School of Architecture if they would have the Rice Building Workshop focus on, instead of a socially driven housing need, could they make a folly? Could they make a way to celebrate the fact that it's Rice University on this side of the street, Herman Park on this side of the street, we're iconic neighbors, let's do something together. And that's where it came from. And I think the results are fantastic. Congratulations to Herman Park, but congratulations to Rice Building Workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. 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 We knew that we had to get it right. Uh, we knew that everyone was going to see this, um, you know, whether they were driving by or experiencing the park or riding on the train. Um, but I think in a way, you know, that, that's great motivation. You know, it's a real opportunity to work, at, to do a real world problem. That's what Building Workshop is all about. To design something and then understand the, the process of making it with your own hands, which is not self-evident and not immediately apparent when you're working in a computer that what you have there is not the real thing but sort of a model of the real thing. So getting your hands dirty and actually uh, you know bending metal and digging dirt is a different thing. So this is the opportunity to do that. It's really great especially near the end of the program for the undergrads and the graduate students. Uh, there begins to be an emphasis on what it really means 
What, what's between those two lines you draw for a wall? What it really means to construct something and getting out here and having the opportunity to see how things go together in real life it, it was a lot of fun. I actually walked by this area every day to get to my apartment and so it was really cool to see uh, this going up as it went up. I walked by it almost every single day and saw how it changed from day to day. And I think that it's really great. There's a lot of things popping up in Herman Park right now to celebrate the centennial and I think it's a, it's a really great thing for Rice and for Houston as a whole. At the forefront of education stands a small school with a big story. One of pioneers, leaders, and entrepreneurs of Oscars, Pulitzers, and Nobel Prizes. A story of the world's most brilliant minds working together to challenge convention, making discoveries that will change the course of history, and innovations that will change everything. Rice University, advancing the world with unconventional wisdom. Welcome back to Inside Rice University. Rice scientists and researchers are always looking into many of today's most challenging questions. During the past few months, they have released new studies on racial inequality among homeowners, exploding cancer cells, and much more. Chorotherapeutics kills the most resistant and aggressive cancer cells without damaging nearby healthy ones. Why not talking about poisoning cells with regular chemotherapy drugs? Why not uh, talking about cooking the cells with heat? We apply intracellular mechanical impact or intracellular explosion and we literally blow cancer cell apart instantaneously. But therapeutics employs four clinically validated components, drugs, gold nanoparticles, laser, and X-rays. The heart of our technology, which we call quadraputics, is plasmonic nanobubble. Plasmonic nanobubble is not a particle, not a drug. It is a very rapid intracellular event. In fact, this is the tiniest explosion at nanoscale. So it allows us to destroy the cell mechanically. It allows us to eject the encapsulated drug and to create very high concentration of anti-cancer drug inside the cell and sadly it helps us to amplify the dose of radiation therapy inside a cancer cell. So all in all we don't poison the cell, we don't cook the cell with the heat. We use me the mechanical and physical very short events with high cancer cell selectivity. So this is unique. Uh, there are other ways of destroying cells which are uh, somewhat similar in philosophy but very different in technology. But this technology by itself is pretty unique. Um, using the existing technologies, augmenting it, and then uh, mechanically destroying cells at a cellular level. We didn't start off thinking to ourselves, okay, in, in four years, um, let's submit to the Best Illusion of the Year contest uh, and see if we win. It was, it very much was a byproduct of research that we've been doing on something we call pop out, basically where you have a, a field of white sheep and, a, and, and one black sheep and the black sheep pops out at you. It's, it's that kind of a concept and uh, trying to figure out what the, the basis of this phenomenon of pop out is. And along the way, we discovered something called false pop out where um, actually one of the white sheep can pop out at you instead of the black sheep. And in trying to take this phenomenon apart down to its bare bones, uh, we came across this, uh, this stimulus where we're basically trying, we were trying to force people to see something as different that wasn't actually different. Most people call the illusions that we're looking at here optical, but most of the illusions that we study in the lab aren't really optical at all. They're visual or neural. So to give an example of an optical illusion, if you take a pencil that's straight and put it in a glass of water, it appears to be bent. That's not our fault. That uh, illusion originates in the light and the fact that when light passes from water, from air into water, it gets refracted or bent. Uh, but when we take this same straight pencil and we put it in motion like so, and we see it go rubbery, that's not in the optics, that's in us. 
That has to do with our slow visual system and slow neurons that aren't responding as rapidly as they ought to because at every exact instant, at every nanosecond, the image of this pencil on the eye is perfectly straight, okay? That's an actual non-rubbery pencil. So, we're interested in then looking at uh, illusions and what they can tell us about how the eye and brain normally function. Uh, and to appreciate the importance of that, uh, you have to understand that the key to perception is discrimination, telling that two things are different. So when we say people have color perception, it means we can tell two different colors apart or wavelengths apart. When we say we have depth perception, it means we can tell two different distances apart. What we study in our lab is really rapid discrimination, things where we don't have to hunt sequentially like in Where's Waldo, but things that simply pop out at you. Now, in order to figure out what's going on with our illusion, you don't need fancy lab equipment, you don't need computers. All you need to do is walk into Starbucks. You know, we all know, that they serve three sizes of coffee at Starbucks, but there are only two sizes of the sleeves that keep you from burning your fingers on the cup, the small and the medium. So, what do you do if you buy the large size coffee at Starbucks? Well, you simply move this one down to here, and you now have the large size. Now this is an illusion called the Jastro illusion. The Jastro is famous because he received the first PhD in psychology ever at Johns Hopkins University in the late 1800s. Uh, and he created a number of illusions and this is one of them. Uh, our illusion is sort of based on this concept. We call this concept the anti-metamer. And we got that name by drawing off of a, a related concept, the metamer. Metamers are two stimuli that are physically different but look the same. So the illusion is basically this picture and you can get it um, without anything moving in the picture but there's three roads and the idea is that most people perceive this road to be different when in actuality this road is the one that's different. So when we take things and we move it around, um, people will be pointing at this one to say that that one's different and then we can just move this guy over here and then all of a sudden, this one looks like it's different, and people see these ones as being more the same. Some people will actually say that all of these look different to them. Um, and then you can just move it back, and we get back to the original display. And doing it this way is great um, for all the non-believers, the, uh, the ones that want to say that we're trying to fake them out. Um, here it is in real time. Well, all the attention that uh, Kim and I have received from this illusion is certainly gratifying. Uh, it wasn't surprising to us because we were told by the organizers of the contest that this was going to happen. I don't think either one of us was sure that it actually was, but it now looks like one month after these videos were put uh, up on the web, we'll have something around a half a million views just on the one, uh, one website alone. So that's gratifying. I think the bigger picture is that it's nice to see the world interested in how the brain operates. It's nice to see the world interested in how we discover how the brain operates. Uh, there's so much out there about our world that's interesting and people follow all the various sciences, physics, chemistry, and biology. Uh, now is sort of the dawn of the area of interest in neuroscience, that we're actually getting to the point where we First of all, understand what the problem is. <laughs> Throughout most of human history, we, we've not really understood what the problem of understanding the mind and brain actually is. But now we're getting tools uh, for, for determining how that works. And uh, the more uh, the attention of the public is focused on that, the better the chances for funding for research of that sort. And uh, then the more likely we'll actually come to understand what is indisputably the most complex organ in the known universe, namely the human brain. title is Emerging Forms of Racial Inequality and Homeownership Exit from 1968 to 2009. And what we wanted to do was to uh, investigate the extent to which uh, racial disparities and transitioning from homeownership back to renting um, existed over a 40-year period, but not only looking at a gross disparity, but also examining whether or not 
uh, African Americans uh, were more likely to exit their homes later over the last few decades starting in the 1990s compared to similar whites. The main contribution of this research is the fact that we go back 40 years and uh, look at racial differences in homeownership exit over time. So the housing literature and housing inequality literature has focused mainly on access to homeownership and the fact that there's been a decline in the racial gap in homeownership. But on the, on the flip side of the coin, very few studies, if any, have looked at the long-term impacts of racial inequality and the extent to which blacks are more likely to exit their homes than whites. And what we, have able, what we were able to find is, um, in addition to what's gone on in the foreclosure crisis, is that if you go back to the late 60s, 1970s, and even early 1980s, black homeowners were mo no more or less likely to exit their homes for renting than were similar whites. And so this disparity has just recently in the last couple decades really emerged, and this is something that hasn't been documented before in the literature. The reason why I'm even interested in homeownership is because research has shown that it truly uh, confers uh, enormous ad advantages to individuals and families, such as the accumulation of wealth, uh, access to valuable public services and amenities like better schools, safer neighborhoods, and a very vibrant community and civic life. Who knew concrete could be permeable, filtering rain into the soil instead of our lakes and streams? Or that a mathematical equation could open our ears to music we've never heard? Or that a happy home could cost less than a family car? Who knew we could build an elevator to space? Rice, unconventional wisdom. Let's all offer a word of thanks for Eleanor Evans' grandfather. Nearly a century ago, he inspired the child who in turn inspired generations of Rice architecture students. Oh, you never stop. It's in your head all the time, all the time. I'm always making ideas for what to do. They make themselves, the ideas just come. I'm just tying knots. I'm trying to tie knots a quarter of an inch apart. I was blessed with a grandfather who lived with us from the day I was born. And he took us walk walking in the woods and through the meadows and pointed out things to us, pointed out things about nature and impressed me that he knew the Latin names of these things. <laughs> He, he taught me to see. We would walk and see a small sprout coming up from the ground and then he would say, we'll look at that tomorrow or we'll look at that next week. And when we did, it had changed. And we would follow this growth, this plant, until it matured and until it blossomed. So I saw the whole thing. This, this is, was my diet growing up, so it stuck with me somehow, and I've always acquired things from nature, interesting pods, interesting seeds, and so forth, and it's, it's been going on since the beginning of my life, and it's just a part, necessary part of me, and then it's not surprising that I learned from these things enough that it, this experience carried over and I used it in my teaching. I'm, I'm not an architect, I never studied architecture. My course was one which 
taught them to see and to invent and to discover their own creativity and many ways of looking, finding many ways of looking at the solution of the problem. My friends are always pushing me to hurry up and go and get a computer, hurry up and go and do this and do that, but I don't have need for it yet. And it would take steal from my time of working. My time is limited. So I want to continue making. Thanks for joining us on Inside Rice University. To learn more about rice, visit rice.edu. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest things going on at Rice. Finally, we leave you with a fishing adventure with the Jones Graduate School of Business. See you next time. This is the second annual Jones Graduate School of Business at Rice University Deep Sea Fishing Expedition. It's a group of about 80 to 100 alumni, students, faculty, and staff from the Jones School. And uh, the point of it is, is really just to kind of to get out, off of campus, to get out into the Gulf because we have that proximity. We'll be about 62, yeah, 62 to 65 miles fishing uh, somewhere in the neighborhood 150 feet of water. We're going to start off trying to catch our red snapper, which we can have a whopping two of those per person. I was an executive MBA student, graduated last year in 2013, but in 2012, Sean Ferguson had asked me, hey, what are you going to do at break for this summer? And I said, well, I'm going to go offshore fishing. And he said, well, that sounds like a great event that Rice could get involved in and really interact with the alumni and other students of different programs. I didn't do it last year, but I have done this before. Not only did I catch a small fish, I caught someone else's rod. Oh, wow. I got something. I finally got one. There we go. Nice fish, man. Get your room two at a time. Loving every minute of it. For me, the rice has just been all, a lot of firsts. So this is the first time I've ever been deep sea fishing. And coming from the East Coast, and moving to Texas, the last thing I thought I'd be doing in Houston was deep sea fishing. Rice being in Houston, Houston has a lot to offer. So, uh, you know, just a lot of people don't realize the, the additional things that are within close proximity of Houston, like coming out to the Gulf to get, like Galveston, obviously, you know, you have the beach, but, you know, there's also opportunities to do stuff like what we're doing today out doing deep sea fishing. Oh my gosh, it's so heavy. Oh! It was great because we got to um, network with not only people in our program but also um, professors and fishing with, with professors and alumni. It was a great networking opportunity. Caught tons of red snapper um, and I think all of us are going home with about two fish each. The moment that we left uh, land, no cell phone reception, which was great because the only thing I was using my cell phone for was capturing memories. And so there was no texting, no Facebook, no Instagram. Um, and so you felt like you really got one-on-one -on -one time with, with folks like you don't normally um, in a typical situation.